So welcome everybody. It's lovely to see you this morning. Lovely to have the whole family with us. It's great to see you. We haven't seen you in ages, so that's wonderful to have you back uh, with us this morning. So my name is Reverend Jenny, and I'm the curate here at St. James's and at Holy Trinity. Now, some of you might have arrived this morning feeling tired, harassed, perhaps stressed, or disappointed about events of the week. However, we don't walk this life alone. God is with us. Let us rest in his presence this morning. And we must not forget how blessed we are to live in a country where we are free to worship, where we are not at war. And this alone should have us dancing in the aisles, something that perhaps we're not very good at in the Church of England. But we come this morning to rejoice and to meditate on the hope that we have in Jesus. There's a verse in 1 Peter 1 um, in the message trans, um, paraphrase that I want to read to you this morning. It says, your life is a journey you must travel with a deep consciousness of God. It cost God dearly and plenty to get you out of that dead end, that empty-headed life you, drew, you grew up in. He paid with Christ's sacred blood. He died like an unblemished sacrificial lamb. And this was no afterthought, even though it has only lately, at the end of the ages, become public knowledge. God always knew he was going to do this for you. It's because of this sacrificed Messiah, whom God then raised from the dead and glorified, that you trust God, that you know you have a future in God. This morning's reading is taken from John chapter 1, verses 29 through to 45. If you're following in the church Bibles, we are on page 1647. The next day, John saw Jesus coming down towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw that they were following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him with to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John, and you will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Thank you, Mark. Let us just pray. Lord Jesus, speak to our hearts today. We go from this place different. Amen. Um, bless you all. Isn't it freezing? Cold? Anyway, um, we have some real talent in this church, and, I, and uh, this is uh, not really to do with the sermon, but uh, um, I'd just like to really encourage our ta talent, and we have our resident poem who would like to encourage us with a nice, sunny poem, wouldn't you? Come along, Alan. <laughs> This is called Summer's Dreams. Dream of long hot holes, secluded coves, tropical drinks under parasols. Relax amongst sun-kissed dunes. Far from the bustle, radio fills the air with summer tunes. Children's joy with bucket and spades, castles, beach balls, bank holiday parades. Safari adventures, climbing and hiking, Energetic activities, wild mountain biking. 
green rolling hills as nature delivers beauty displayed as we stroll along its rivers. Thank you, Alan. That's wonderful. Do you feel warmer now? <laughs> Thinking about your times away and the holidays, I have to confess I'm about to go on one. And I've just checked, it's 20 degrees out there. Just saying, you know. So um, don't feel jealous, but I will be warm next week. Um, but I will be praying for you. It's really important, though, that we have time out, isn't it? It's really time that we have time and um, time to relax, time to do things. And, and uh, you know, I look at John the Baptist. I'm going to talk particularly about John the Baptist. And he seems to be to someone to me that had a lot of time in the desert and a lot of time out. Um, but he uh, spent it, of course, listening to God. Um, so I'm going to give you now, we've got a little video now to give you a kind of visual of thinking about John the Baptist and what it might have been like in that desert for him. So I've got a small clip. Thank you. And you too have not ceased to be sons of Jacob. From the days of your forefathers, you have been wayward and have not kept my laws. If you will return to me, I will return to you, says the Lord. Do not think you will be saved by your rituals, by going to the temple. It is not sacrifices the Lord demands. Bring no more vain offerings, saith the Lord. I delight not in the blood of bullocks and of lambs. The sacrifice God demands is a repentant heart. What do we do then to be saved? Change your hearts. Take the right way. The Lord saith, my ways are not your ways. Why speak as though none of us know the way to salvation? We know the law as well as you, and we try to obey it. We are the sons of Abraham. We have always kept the law. To those of you that deem themselves just and pious, I say that you must bring the fruits of repentance. Do not content yourself with saying, Abraham was our father, and that is enough to save us. The Lord could take any one of these stones and turn it into a son of Abraham. So it might make you feel a little bit warmer just looking at the desert, hopefully. But um, the wonderful here, I just wanted to play that really to get our minds to think about something how about, how would have John appeared to those around him? How would John the Baptist have appeared to those around him? You know, think about the circumstances at the moment. His message, of course, as you heard from that, which was brought brilliantly, is one of repentance. Repentance, of course, means that we are called to turn away from what is past and go forward into a different direction towards God. So that's what repentance is. When we talk about repentance, about actually going, do you know what, I'm not going to go away from God anymore, I'm going to go away towards God. What's God want with my life? What is God going to do in my life? So it's about turning the other way, okay? The direction, um, particularly turning a direction that leads to life, a direction that leads to Messiah Jesus. Now, last week, we looked at the baptism of Je Jesus by John, um, didn't we, of uh, John the Baptist, if you remember, if you were here, you know, we did, we looked at the, the um, baptism of John the Baptist. So I wanted to take a different direction slightly um, in this, um, different angle. And this is about John proclaiming who Jesus is. John is really proclaiming who Jesus is in these scriptures. He's really making it very clear. But I want to go a little bit further back and start with who actually John was. Who was he? Now, John was really known for being a man who would challenge the authorities around him. You can kind of, that video does it very well, doesn't it? It's kind of like, oh, in your face, and he's challenging. You can see he probably wasn't that popular with some of them. Um, and that shows itself um, in the way that actually he died. Um, but he's a man who challenged others and how they lived. He wasn't scared to say the stuff, wasn't he? He wasn't scared to go, do you know what? You need to get your life right. It's great. And of course, that led actually to his death. It actually led to his head being, being given on a platter. Not particularly very pleasant, is it, idea? But his head was actually chopped off and put on a platter as he was imprisoned for criticizing Herod and executed when Herod's stepdaughter, Salome, danced 
for Herod in exchange for his head. Okay, so that's how he died. But he was also, as was shown in that video, he's a man that lived incredibly simply, lived in the desert. Um, some of them would have perhaps seen him quite negatively. I don't know about you, but it's true, isn't it? People that are kind of radical and stand out and shout out like that are sometimes seen quite negatively. He would have been perhaps thought of as a kind of madman by some, no doubt. Maybe irrelevant by some even. But of course, there are those as well that would listen to him and would actually be impacted by him. But he didn't let anything stop his purpose. He didn't let anything stop the purpose of God in his life. John knew he wasn't perfect. He was very aware that he wasn't the perfect. He didn't pretend to be the Messiah. And he also knew he had to turn away from the past to grasp the eternal future seen in Jesus. He knew that. Now, Jesus, of course, was believed to be John's cousin, as we know, born of Elizabeth. His dad was a priest, so this is who we're talking about here, this, this man born of a priest and um, uh, this wonderful woman, Elizabeth, that was his mother. Elizabeth, cousin of Mary. And I do wonder, um, since John jumped when he was in the womb and he met Jesus in Mary's womb, do you know, I just wonder what the conversations with his, what, with his mother would have been like when he was growing up. Do you ever thought about that? The fact that there was this meeting in the womb, the fact that there was this understanding of who Jesus was at that point. I can't help but think that his mother would have actually told him that Jesus was pretty special. You know, so something, there's something here, isn't there, that goes beyond just the words we read there. Since Elizabeth knew that Mary was carrying the Messiah, Luke 1 reads, But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So she knew. So there must have been chats along the way, mustn't there, going, do you know your cousin Jesus? Well, he's like kind of special, isn't it? There must have been something going there. <coughs> so they, because they were the words of Elizabeth um, on meeting the pregnant Mary. Now, John, um, so John was expecting Jesus. He was expecting the Messiah to come. But isn't it interesting, there's later on, there are scriptures beyond that, which when he's in prison, just before he gets his head, you know, cut off, okay? There are later um, scriptures when John is in prison where he is still asking Jesus if he is the one or to expect another. What a contradiction. What a contradiction. Isn't it wonderful to read those contradictions and to know that people suffered doubt that we don't perhaps expect to suffer doubt. John must have been going, even though there's all this evidence, you're not quite what I expected. Maybe he's a little bit stifled by the past, I wondered. How could his cousin be the Messiah? Maybe he's stifled by the fact that Jesus had grown up as a boy and perhaps he found it hard to see the man. So sometimes, I don't know, when you grow up, it's quite hard. Sometimes our families, don't they? They can't see us. When we grow up, they still treat us like we're children. Do you know what I mean? Or they can still treat us in certain ways. So maybe there's something going in here in John's head at that moment. Who knows? But they're interesting things to think about because if you look at the way the scriptures are lined up and what they say, you've got to ask yourself some questions with that. He's a full of contradiction, full of contradiction. Here, proclaiming Jesus' identity and then later doubting it and going, are you the one, actually? You know, hang on. I wonder if um, we can be a bit like that sometimes. Can you be a little bit like that? Can I? Do we have days when we proclaim Jesus is Lord and we really know it? Do we have other days when we question, are you really God? Are you really working in my life? Do we have those moments of doubt? And if John the Baptist had them, it kind of gives us a bit of hope, doesn't it? It happens. Maybe our life has not been fitted the pattern that we expected. And maybe we thought God would lead us down a different path. Maybe we've got so many questions and we don't know what to do with them sometimes. Maybe things didn't look the way we thought they would. And we have questioned Jesus. What are you doing with my life, Jesus? It shouldn't have been like this. It should have been like that. Maybe we've got those things going on inside us. However, the thing is, of course, we are just called to believe and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us on. 
And you know what? It might not be until you get to eternity you look down and really see the things that God has used you for in your life, the conversations you've had, the way that your life has gone has perhaps affected more people than you know for the gospel. We are just called to believe, to serve. We are informed by our past. And we could carry, we hopefully could carry the good things into the next season. We have things in our past that are really good. It's good, isn't it, to carry them on, to let them be there. But we can also cast things off from our past, and we should, that are not so good. But sometimes we carry those on into our future as well, and that can be a bit of a problem. The point is, we don't have to be defined by our past. Jesus, you know, growing up as a boy, became a man. God, fully God, fully man. May we have to allow our past to hold us uh, maybe we have allowed, sorry, our past to hold us back from really understanding the depths that God loves us. Still believe in the lies we were told, perhaps, as we were growing up, that we're not lovable. Perhaps believe in stuff about ourselves that we've believed that isn't true, that we're not really worth God's love. Maybe we're stuck in stuff. Maybe we don't understand those depths. Maybe we haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to work in us as the Holy Spirit should, to change us, to mold us, to recreate our hearts. Maybe we've gone back to our old life, a mindset, after proclaiming that Jesus is Lord without realizing it at times. And maybe we've let others keep us in our past. The way that they think of us perhaps hasn't changed or the way they see us is limited. That's not the way God sees you. That's not the way God sees me. Here we have Jesus being proclaimed as the Lamb of God by John the Baptist. And in this instance, by using those words, Lamb of God, John is showing his understanding of not only who he thinks Jesus is at that very moment, but why he came to earth. He's understanding it. He's going, this is the Messiah. He come to earth. He came to earth to sacrifice himself in place of others as a lamb, to set others free. He's recognizing that in that moment. He's recognizing that this is the way of forgiveness. This is the way of hope. This is the good news arriving on earth. The sacrifice, of course, of the lamb at that time would have been understood, you see, by the Jews um, to, to be for all the sins. Everything we do wrong is taken by the Lamb. They understood it because they knew that in their worship, and that was part of the sort of pre seeing who Jesus was as he comes as the Lamb of God to sacrifice, to die, to rise again. For you, for me. And John the Baptist is incredible, isn't he? Because he's always one that points us to the Messiah doesn't he? Always points us to Messiah. Even if he gets moments of those doubts, is are you the one or not? He points actually beyond himself. He never points to himself. He's always going, it's something beyond me. There's something more. There's someone coming. There's a Messiah. It's not me. We are all called to be like John, to point others to the Savior. And of course, the great thing is we already know about the cross. We know that Jesus died and rose again and conquered death. We know that. We know that Jesus did that. John hadn't got that knowledge of Jesus rising at that point from the dead. So he's in a different place. But we've got that knowledge. And we point everyone else to the Savior. It's Jesus who saves. It's Jesus who will change lives. It's Jesus who makes the difference. John knows it's the Messiah that will do that. We must point others to Jesus for them to be freed. And the message for us today is repent, repent, repent. But it's not a depressing thing, it's a joyful thing because it means go the other way towards Jesus, not, not away from him. It's a good thing. It's running into the arms of the living God who loves you. It's letting go of past things that have held you back. It's about trusting and going forward, the word repent. It's about changing your direction. It's a moment of choice. 
I'm going to go towards Jesus, not away from him in my life, in every area of my life. How to do that, Lord? Help me. All I need to do is stand towards him. That's the God who loves us. Jesus is Lord. The Holy Spirit is active. Allowing God to be central to whatever is going on in your life will change your life. And you will go in a different direction. And it's not about all our circumstances around us. It's about our heart. It's about what happens inside of you. It's, you know, we are saved inside. God changes our heart and our heads to cope with the things around us. Now, the relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus is actually quite fascinating. And here we have this wonderful picture of, actually, Jesus walking towards John, don't we? So I want you just for a moment, while I just speak, and just for a moment, imagine for a moment that Jesus is walking towards you. Imagine Jesus is walking towards you. And as he walks towards you, there is a revelation. This is God. This is the God who died. This is the God who rose. This is the God of eternity. This is the God that can change everything in your life. And he's walking towards you, not away from you. This is the one who will be slain like a lamb, as a sacrifice, just for you. Because God loves you. The one who through the death and resurrection will bring you life and hope that is eternal. He's walking towards you. The next statement that John says reminds us that Jesus has always been as well. He states that Jesus, who will come after him, John, is actually before him. He's recognizing that Jesus is God. He's forever been always Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all God. He's king. He's the one that's been. And in the preceding scriptures, we're reminded, of course, if you go back and read in John, that the word is Jesus, and he was in the beginning, and everything was made through him. So imagine Jesus is just walking towards you, the one who created everything. How would you really feel? How do you feel when you think about that? And all he wants is to love you, to know you, to embrace you, to accept you, to make your life better. One day, each one of us will be face to face with Jesus. We will face him. Either we know him or we don't. Either we turn to him and the life he offers, or we didn't. We're given choice, great gift. I encourage you to choose, to choose Jesus, to choose life. He's our measure. How's your relationship with Jesus? Do you spend time with him? Are you transformed and being transformed to be more like him? What are your actions? You know, it's, it's, it's our actions come out of our being, of knowing God, not the other way around. By the way, you can't earn it. You just need to accept you're loved and then allow God to just work in your life. And do you know what? Your actions will change. Things will change. Do you know, kindness and compassion are so underestimated in our world, aren't they? But they don't make us weak. They make us strong. The lamb here, of course, gives us a picture of a mild and kind God. This is a tough God who can do anything. But it gives us that picture of a God who will do anything to have a relationship with you. God is creator of the world. Creator of the world and wants to know you. And when we exhibit the fruit of Jesus, we can also expect, by the way, more trouble. You know, there will be trouble in this world for those of us that believe because others will look on and they will be, what's going on? They think we're mad. They think we're crazy. Think, what, what's going on? They won't understand it. But it, don't, does, um, but it does mean that we don't carry stuff alone. You will never carry stuff alone when Jesus is in your life. 
you carry it with him. Doesn't mean you won't go through stuff. Just means you've got the living Lord Jesus walking alongside, helping you. And you'll gain purpose. And it's a purpose that goes into eternity beyond this life. The most kind and compassionate man that ever lived was Jesus. And do you know what happened to him? He got stabbed in the back by his friends. He got condemned by those around him. He was hated by many because he stood for what was good. We can expect the same as we become disciples at times, and it's hard, and we have to remain in grace, and we have to remain in mercy, and that's where the world changes when you do that. We must never stop allowing Jesus to walk towards us, and we must never stop from keep turning towards him, because when Jesus is central to it all, it changes how how you are in it. Now, John the Apostle, who wrote this book, let's get this clear, not John the Baptist I'm talking about now, the one who wrote this particular gospel, uh, watches for signs all the way through his book. Go and read John, it's wonderful. It's like he points constantly to who Jesus is. Big one for signs, you know, he's been great um, as a... Ad, um, doing advertising or something, wouldn't he, in the world today? But he does. But he points us towards Jesus. Just like John the Baptist pointed towards Jesus. And here in this wonderful scripture, we have the dove, which of course is the Holy Spirit remaining on Jesus. A sign. This is the power of God represented in a bird that is pure and white, gentle, and yet powerful. We are called to be obedient, pure, compassionate, gentle, and we are called to stand firm in Jesus. And it was the seal of the Spirit that revealed to John the Baptist the identity of Jesus. This, 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 um, the dove coming down, it was together. Okay, there's the Holy Spirit. Well, my cousin is the Messiah. Wow. Something's going on here. So can others see the seal of the Spirit on you and in you and through you? Where's the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you allow the Spirit to change you so that you can show others Jesus? See, John knows that it's not him that others need to follow. He's not in control, and we don't want people following us. We want them to have a real relationship with a living God. So this year, take time to allow Jesus to walk towards you and walk towards him in return, face to face. Stop allowing, so stop following the false things in your life. Be someone who seeks his spirit and spends time with him. Turn the right way. Let go of the past that holds you back or those that hold you back in the past. Step into the future with the living God, the one that was raised from the dead, that offers us life eternal and hope. I'm going to invite you to just, if you can stand for a moment, and I'm going to invite the band up as well. I'm going to just turn and pray for a minute. First of all, I just want to ask the Lord to release us from anything in the past that is holding you back. Or people in the past that are holding you back. Things that they say about you that are not true. Things that are going on in your life that hold you back. Lord Jesus, we just pray now by the Holy Spirit now that you will help us to lay down anything of the past that holds us back. Reveal that to us now. Any lies we believed. Any things that stop us living as truly children of the living God. Any things we've not trusted God with. And imagine Jesus walking towards you. What would Jesus say to you? He knows you. He loves you. He wants the best for you. What would Jesus say to you?
I pray you feel his love now, his acceptance, his acknowledgement of who you are, beautifully created child of God. As we draw this service to a close, we end with a Celtic blessing. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. And may he bring you home rejoicing once again unto our doors. And may the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. <laughs>